So we're going to have a little conversation here, but we're, we're probably not going to tell you everything you wanted to know about the NSA. Uh, and if that's what you came for, sorry. But uh, Shyam Sankar from Palantir. How many of you here in the audience know Palantir? Just, OK. Uh, how many of you are German and think it's the devil? <laughs> OK, good. It's a friendly audience. Apparently. Uh, tell me, well, first describe Palantir for the people who didn't raise their hands, and then I'm going to ask you what your role is. Sure. So I think we, people talk a lot about big data, and they focus on the volume of the data. The second part that is less kind of thought of, but I think equally important, is the disparity of the data. Uh, it, it's actually really hard to bring together lots of different data so that humans can make sense of it. Uh, and so if you think about the volume of data increasing at an increasing rate, which is almost a banality, and then you think about the number of data sources increasing at an increasing rate, then the only thing that matters is the marginal cost of data integration. Like, how long does it take me as a human to make sense of what new types of information, not just new data bits, are coming in? So we solve that problem through a product. And the typical way you solve that is kind of one-off, non-replicable, or, or rather bespoke. And the other part, which is kind of embedded in what I say that we focus on, is not AI, but IA. You know, instead of thinking about how do we replace the human, we think about how do we augment the human, IA being intelligence augmentation. So when it's kind of not just user-centric design, uh, and, and so maybe I disagree a little bit with Acel here in terms of will we be replaced in 10 years by robots, maybe. But thinking about uh, another vision, the kind of the, the competing vision to Minsky's vision, which is Licklider's vision around how do you make humans much more productive. So uh, I don't know how many people were here yesterday when I interviewed Iyad Madish from ResearchGate, which interestingly, both of you, both companies have Peter Thiel as an investor. And the ResearchGate right now is a whole bunch of disparate researchers, scientists, four million of them, with most of their papers online. And those people can talk to one another as scientists, but their research papers don't talk to one another. And in a sense, that's the problem you're solving. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I find the research gate vision hugely compelling, and clearly I think that's a, that's a direction they'll go. But the way I think about it as, uh, is, com is like the compounding interest on the knowledge that you have. Right, if you can actually leverage that so that there are no fresh starts, so that you really are standing on yeah. the giants of the, shol the, the shoulders of the giants who came before you, that's really compelling. So ResearchGate should be one of your best customers. I, I, but, you know, I think we should talk to them. But mostly your customers are, you tell me. Mostly our customers are large organizations who have lots of kind of legacy data issues you know, any institution in the world that's existed for some period of time, more than five years, has a problem with how do I make sense of different data that I originally collected for lots of different purposes. This was for business intelligence, this was for operations. You know, if I can mix the two in an interesting way, there's something, there's something there. Um, so a couple concrete examples, like we were talking earlier about typhoon relief. Uh, if you're an NGO on the ground, you're collecting your own data, you're creating a stream, you might be feeding that to the UN. There may be 100 NGOs after Hyon on the ground, all with different data formats, all who have a very small slice of what's actually going on. Uh, so if you, can actually, if you can integrate that, you now have a common picture of what is the ground truth, what is needed where, and how to allocate your resources for all of the NGOs, for everyone who's participating. And that's the sort of transformation that we seek to make. And can you name any of your clients? There, you know, it's, there, there are some clients that are publicly written about, large banks, uh, large NGOs, government large organizations. Government. I mean, so CIA, NSA, blah, blah, blah. Okay, <laughs> silence. Um, kind of like McKinsey, can you name any commercial clients? Sure, I mean, there are uh, you know, media companies, oil and gas companies, big banks like JP Morgan, um, uh, insurance companies. Um, so explain what you do, I mean, I guess one question is customer data, how do you... The, the original, so I mean, there's, there's a question of like, how do you bring this data? So we build software that our customers run on their premises. 
Uh, but one of the original visions, because we did start off thinking about how we could help governments solve really hard security problems. Uh, and of course, Peter is a well-known libertarian, and Alex is well-known to be left of center, um, to say it mildly, uh, that there's essentially a new efficient frontier that's possible, a pr essentially a Pareto preferred outcome, where you have more security and more privacy. And that to achieve a vision like that required real technologists working on privacy as a first-class technology problem. And you know, if, if you think about how many of the technologists in this room today are engaging on these problems in this way, it, you can see that there's, there's a need for this sort of infrastructure. So you, it's very obvious how this applies in government, but I think it's also hugely applicable in the commercial space. Like, how do you protect healthcare information where the, who you are determines what you have access to and why you need this information determines what you have access to? So what you're doing is you're, you're kind of identifying the data and the people who use it and installing code-based rules, if you like. Yes, yeah, essentially at, at a policy level, you can think about protecting data in two ways. One is how do you, you, know, how do you regulate or, or think about rules on what you collect? We don't actually deal with collection, but that's, that's, that was a very effective paradigm when we were data poor. Uh, you know, it was easy to kind of limit the stream. In, in today's world, that's necessary. You can't do away with that, but it's not sufficient. You need to think about how do you control how data is used. And so, and, and to do that effectively, you have to know where this data came from. So if you go back to my data integration idea, when you're bringing all of this data together, you can't lose the origin of it. You must be able to decompose it so that you can know who can see what based on where it came from. Right, so, I mean, to go back to your business, just to clarify, you, the way the NSA now wants to work with consumer data, you don't actually hold any data. You, nor do you even hold any software. You develop it, and then it all runs on the client servers. Is that correct? That's right. We, we, we build on-premise software, so it's not hosted. We're not hosting software. We're not hosting data. Yeah, so you're, in a sense, you're totally divorced from this stuff. Well, I think if you're, you know, for example, my health insurance company, I'd, I'd much rather my health insurance company host my health data than, or, or that, that the data is, per, it, you know, it ha, there's con, due consideration for how the data is being protected yes. and who it's being given to. Yeah, so your, your clients take your software and then they use it to integrate their data. And what, so talk about your job versus the other half of Palantir? The way that we've, we've kind of organized the company is there's, there's a group of engineers that work on building the platforms. And on top of these platforms, you have products. And you kind of some arrangement of products comprised an offering. And they're kind of tied to the success of the platforms and the development and advancement of it. And we have another group of engineers, the team that I lead, that focuses on customer success. Like, how do you use these tools that are available to solve problems that matter in the world? We were talking about Team Rubicon, a nonprofit that we both know. Uh, Team Rubicon's yeah, a bunch of Marines. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. a lot of uh, former soldiers who have left, uh, who respond to disasters on a moment's notice. They go there, they help clean up, they help people. Uh, so we help them with the operational logistics. Like, how do you take requisitions using mobile devices for what needs fixing? And then how do you actually manage the, and organize you know, surges of volunteers that come in and, and pallets of socks and shoes and where do they go and all the logistics involved with that? Um, uh, so if you look at something like that, the first, you, you have all of this infrastructure, all, this product, all these products we've built to integrate data that's coming in. Then the question is, how do you apply it to solve a problem that matters to this organization? Uh, and then once you kind of get that arrangement right, you have essentially a bundled product offering. So now Team Rubicon, you know, who are basically non-technical veterans, run and manage the deployment on their own. And you, you've created kind of a, a new solution for that space. And then what kinds of problems do they run into? Uh, I think the usual kind of banal enterprise software problems, like, you know, I want new features that help me do these things. Or, uh, or I mean, more like human problems. Uh, oh, oh, I see, in, in effort of, of getting things done. Well, you know, I, I mean, NGOs are particularly tricky because there's, there's a lot of people in a lot of places. Um, and so how do you coordinate NGOs, I think, is, is a very, very challenging thing for them. Uh, I think in some ways data can actually help with these, with these issues themselves. Yeah. So I'll be less polite. Um, 
Team Rubicon and USAID didn't get along. And I, I know in history, the CIA and the FBI don't get along. And most of you probably in your companies, various people don't get along. You know, it's, at, some, at some level, I think the technical solution to secure information sharing helps get around a lot of these issues. So like the interface between the humans that could otherwise be highly political, you can, you can systematize in a, in a way that's like transparent, you know what's happening, and it's not subject to the whims of kind of what's in my rice bowl, what's in your rice bowl. And do you think you've been successful in making that work for a lot of your clients? I think we've at least removed the ability for someone to pretend there's a technical objection. You know, for, uh, you know, you can no longer say, well, this isn't possible. You now have to, you know, kind of overtly admit that there's a political agenda there. Thank you. Uh, that's worth tweeting. <laughs> so tell me, Palantir is considered to be a secretive organization. And why, why are you here? Uh, I, you know, I think maybe because we're not a secretive organization, I think one wonders how they, how, how, you know, how one is perceived and it's very hard to tell these things. We certainly don't perceive ourselves as secretive. We, I think if you look at the history of the company, we were, we were working on enterprise software in 2004 and 2005 when Ajax was just coming out and that was the rage. And if you weren't doing consumer, it was super easy to be ignored in the valley. And I think we just, after getting rejected by VC after VC, stopped looking for rejection in a sense, and you know, just talks amongst ourselves. And dealt with large clients. And a lot of our work is out, you know, it's like you, we focus on solving problems that are kind of in the world. Yeah. And some of those problems are in the valley, but actually the vast majority of them aren't. If you want to go and do disaster relief, you have to go to the Philippines the day after the disaster. And so a lot of our interaction where we're meeting people is in the world. Not in Silicon Valley or even in Berlin or Munich. Well, maybe I'm Munich. So how do you, how is this community relevant to Palantir, if at all? Or is it really just on the way to Davos to talk to the large customers? Uh, I think it is certainly relevant. I was talking to, uh, to somebody who's working on water issues, actually, someone who I never would have come across. And you know, California is now not only in a state of drought, but if you think about it, this is like one of the existential issues that we face at, in humanity. I was actually, I was telling him that you know, before Delhi was the capital in India, Agra was the capital, and before Agra, Fateh were Sikri, and they had abandoned their first capital because they ran out of water. And you think, you know, so I, I, I have this existential angst around, like, what does this mean for the valley, actually, in our three-year doubt, or drought, uh, and then maybe doubts about whether we can stay there. Uh, but, like, working on those sorts of problems, which we've done, we've worked on a lot of the Sacramento River Delta problems um, already. It's like, these are the important problems to go find people who have these problems, and how can data help you, uh, and then how can we help with that data to solve these problems? Do we have any audience questions? We have a few minutes left, and I'd like to get the audience involved. Um, or not, I'll keep. OK. Uh, so it's, you told Forbes magazine that you joined Palantir because you wanted meaning. And you, you, were not, you were number 19 or something. Number 13. Number 13. Yeah. yeah. What did you do before then, and how did you come to Palantir? Uh, so before Palantir, I worked at uh, another startup in San Francisco, a consumer-facing international money transfer company called Zoom. Uh, but I was really drawn. I was in upstate New York not during 9-11. I think there's certainly, I even notice it between my brother, who's eight years younger than me and I, there's, there's, there's kind of a generational impact of, of, of that experience. And uh, I also have, you know, my parents were basically refugees from Nigeria to the US and was raised with a kind of a deep sense of appreciation for what security means. My uncle was a victim of the 2006 coordinated train bombings in Bombay. Um, also a deep sense of, of what a functioning response to security means there. One, one thing that was truly shocking to me is after 2611, which is in 2008, I think, maybe 2009, uh, to 2012, there were 60 subsequent attacks in India and almost no kind of political change, no manifestation. It's like, so you, you think about a very large democracy and how it reacts to it. You think about the, very, the, like the variety of that response and what you hope as a citizen for that sort of response. Um, it was an opportunity to, to engage in a problem that I thought was really important when I felt like the Valley might have been, you know, like everything that's going on there is really interesting, but some of the stuff's a little trivial. Mm -hmm. Like how do you get out in the world and work on things that affect the lives of people and hopefully make it better? 
And were you surprised at what Edward Snowden revealed? Um, a little bit. I'll just leave it at that. I, I, I always felt like the, my, my part of the takeaway there is like, you know, in a democracy, you have to bias extremely towards transparency. And in many ways, I think uh, the CEO of, of Berta was saying he, he noticed how little the politicians were surprised by the re re revelations. Pol politicians call it career civil service, right? And I think, like, in some sense, the volatility is, there's a huge reconciliation between what is kind of common knowledge for the public and what is common knowledge amongst those who are policymakers. And would you make changes in how things are done in the U.S. or simply in how they're disclosed? My, personally, I would do a little bit, I would do both. Uh, you know, I, I kind of think about it, the way I think about it is first you have the, like, the politics. And at, at the politics level, you have one camp that's like security at all costs, more or less. They, they, they wouldn't frame it, they say security with, with consideration for privacy. Then you have another camp, that's probably the most fair way to say it, another camp that would say privacy with some consideration for security, but they're really highly subordinated. The truth exists on both extremes. You obviously need both. Nobody wants to live in a perfectly secure world with no privacy, at least I, I don't want to live in that world. And, and conversely, I know what it's like to live in a world where you know, you're basically completely anonymous, but you have no security. Uh, and so then, then it's about wrestling with those trade-offs. And I think it's easier to be kind of ideologically biased on one side or the other because those trade-offs are really hard. And then you have to figure out how do you make some of these, how do you push out the efficient frontier? Maybe this doesn't have to be a trade-off. Like a very trivial example, and I think many of them are harder, so that's why I couch it as a trivial example, is when those, uh, like the screening devices, the x-ray screening devices came in airports. First, they were giving photorealistic renderings of the body, right? So it was, it was showing exactly what you look like basically with no clothes. And then with engagement, uh, you know, after lots of vitriol, it became obvious that you could indicate areas of concern without actually rendering what my body looked like by, by making it a caricature or a cartoon. Uh, and that's a super minor thing, but it basically ameliorated most of the current concerns that people had going through these devices. Um, and and that, that requires constructive engagement. You know, I don't think you can do it by just you know, bashing each other. So at a level below the, the politics, we've talked a little about the policies, like how do you control what you collect? Importantly, how do you spend even more time and energy thinking about how do, you, how do you control how people will use this data? That requires a robust oversight function to the point of like what would you change? Like what new things need to be built? Um, or, or like, you know, some of these things exist actually, but they need to be made kind of more prescient and kind of more primal. Okay, I think you'll be glad to know we're out of time. Thank you very much, <laughs> that was you. great.